June 2, 1953. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary, better known as Queen Elizabeth II, was preparing for her coronation at the age of 25. Her father, King George VI, had passed away a year earlier, and after a year of nationwide mourning, it was time for Elizabeth to take his place as monarch. For her coronation day, Elizabeth had many options to pull from the royal collection. Brooches, necklaces, pendants, but one of her adornments stood out, a pair of diamond earrings. The diamonds were originally part of the armlet setting of the famous Koh-i-Noor diamond. In 1849, as part of the treaty that ceded Lahore to the British East India Company, the Koh-i-Noor was specifically earmarked for Queen Victoria, though many would argue that it was not legally hers for the taking and competing claims for its rightful ownership continue to this day. The Koh-i-Noor itself was set in a brooch, while the flanking diamonds from the armlet setting were reused, first as part of the Timor ruby necklace in 1853, and then as the earrings pendants in 1858. The earrings are comprised of a pair of cushion-cut diamond collet studs, from which a pair of round brilliants and two large pear-shaped pendants are suspended. The pear-shaped diamonds are sisters, not twins, they are very similar in shape and cut, but they are not identical. Until June 2, 1953, piercings of any kind were considered crass and uncivilized. But on that day, along with the sovereign ring and the imperial state crown, Queen Elizabeth II wore what would become known as the coronation earrings. In the words of piercing historian Paul King, when the richest and arguably most powerful woman in the world has her ears pierced, it turned all prevailing notions about piercings on their head. While Queen Elizabeth was nowhere near the first to pierce her body, her coronation served as an invitation to change and alter your body for years to come. Piercings have been a ritual for many decades around the globe. King argues that, quote, I can safely say piercings are prehistoric and human remains suggest body modification goes back 25,000 years. However, it is hard to know exactly how widespread piercings were, since they are generally performed on soft tissue like skin and muscle that degrade quickly over time. The earliest physical evidence came from Tanzania. Skeletal remains of a young late Pleistocene era man dubbed Olduvai Hominid I, or OH1, were excavated in 1913. Previous research on his teeth suggested that they had been filed down in a body modification practice, the practice of ablation, where teeth are purposefully removed or modified. However, current research suggests that, based on the era in which this man lived, as well as the negative imprint from a very specific pattern of dental wear, OH1 had actually been wearing a lip ring. The stretching of the earlobes to make longer and wider holes was common in communities living in the Rift Valley and the central and western parts of Kenya, who used heavy hardwood logs to stretch the earlobes. In ancient Rome, piercings were popularized by studs in the ears. However, they were not just a decoration, but a utility. When used in a certain area on a man, and I'm hoping you will know that area based on the context I'm about to give you, piercings were a way of controlling sexuality to stop certain people from procreating, prevent athletes from using up testosterone, and to keep singers' voices high-pitched. In Mesoamerica, jewelry for piercings was made from jade and organic glass. According to Vitality Materialized on the Piercing and Adornment of the Body in Mesoamerica by Andrew Feingold, in addition to creating spaces to accommodate jewels, the perforation of the body was an activity that carried social significance most notably in the form of auto-sacrificial bloodletting, but also in rituals that accompanied coming-of-age ceremonies and accession rites. To ward off smallpox and honor deities, Hindus in India pierced their skin with hooks. Across Northern Europe, indigenous people were also stretching their ears. But as the Roman Empire expanded across the world, so too did its Christian influence. 
Christians at the time believed that piercing a body that was made perfectly in God's image was sinful and wrong, and therefore a threat to Christian values. According to Day's digital writer, Parissa Hashimpur, in the Western world, piercings were typically only found on people in the outer fringes of society, like sailors and sex workers. This was true for essentially any invader or colonizer around the globe who weaponized Christianity. The Romans across Europe, Spain in Mesoamerica, Britain in Africa and India. Piercings made you a target. They became one more way colonialists could assert their supposed superiority and point out differences as an excuse to commit atrocities. Like many forms of self-expression, such as makeup and wigs, social acceptance of piercings in Europe both grew and wavered over time, but seemingly only for Europeans. Many hip 17th century creatives such as William Shakespeare had their ear pierced, but apparently that same piercing 50 years later would have been unacceptable. Fast forward to early 20th century France, when the Bohemian movement was in full swing and performers exploited Orientalist fascination to appear more exotic. Mademoiselle Polaire, who marketed herself as the, quote, world's ugliest woman, sported a South East Asian inspired nose ring. This fascination among Westerners only grew after Queen Elizabeth girl bossed her way into letting the rest of the world pierce themselves. In the 1960s, hippies from the United States and England were pouring into a now independent India and adopting their religion, well, parts of their religion, their cultural fashion, and among women, their nose rings. Though piercing anything aside from your ears, if you were female, was something that was practiced only among marginal subcultures, those subcultures grew and grew. Vibrant underground cultures such as the punk movement and the LGBT movements were enthusiastic participants in piercing. In the 1960s and early 70s, Brian Skelly, veteran piercer and board member of the Association of Professional Piercers, says, the majority of people were piercing themselves or had a friend brave enough to do it for them. Safety precautions varied and it resulted in a lot of infections and inappropriate placements. In the mid-1970s, Jim Ward opened The Gauntlet in West Hollywood, California. It was a piercing shop that employed trained and skilled piercers, and it was the first of its kind. Gauntlet employees hosted traveling piercing clinics around the US, and lines would be out the door. In London, a man named Mr. Sebastian set up his own piercing shop. By the 1980s, piercing was a rite of passage for a lot of these underground communities and served as an identifying community trait. By the 1990s, fashion designers such as Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood were borrowing inspiration from these communities, and soon enough, piercing was pulled into the mainstream. In 1993, Aerosmith released a music video for their song, Cryin', which featured a young, unknown actress named Alicia Silverstone getting her belly button pierced. According to King, the piercing anthropologist and, funny enough, the guy who played the guy piercing Alicia Silverstone's belly button in the music video, said, It became the video of the year on MTV. Every 15 minutes that damn video played, and so every 15 minutes people saw a navel piercing. Musicians of the 90s were also popularizing facial piercings, sporting jewelry in their lips, nose, eyebrows, and ears. The popularity of piercings trickling down to teenagers had parents in a tizzy but that just made piercing as a rebellion a lot more appealing. I mean, even Lizzie McGuire wanted a nose ring for crying out loud. Take a chill pill, parents, it's just a time. It can feel rebellious. It can be a form of self-expression, says Tracy Cannon, a piercer at London's Sacred Gold Studio. But it also helps people belong and form identity. When I pierce people for the first time, they often say they feel part of the club now. And by the early 2000s, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, and Beyonce were a part of that club, showing off their belly button rings and their nose rings. A lot of my friends in high school even had belly button rings. I mean, I didn't because if I did, I wouldn't be making this video for you today. And we were kind of losers. Statement earrings even became a feature of couture runway from designer brands like Dior and Givenchy. However, much like in the 17th century, views on piercings evolve over time. According to King, we don't do the same quantities of piercings today. In the mid-90s, a piercer might be doing up to 50 a day. Stigmas in the workplace and other social environments may play a part in that. But evolving cultural opinions don't necessarily mean a halt in piercings, but a change in placement, a shift in aesthetic, and an improvement of safety protocols. 
It's clear that people still love piercings as a form of self-expression, but trend more toward discreet options. Rather than a barbell through the bridge of the nose, we see a lot of dainty hoops through the nostril or septum. The curated ear is extremely popular. People still love having piercings in places that their clothing will cover. We as human beings have always used our bodies as vessels. We have changed our bodies to communicate to the gods or to identify membership with certain groups, and more recently, as a means of self-expression. It's a way of showing others who we are and what we believe in. I think that piercings are a really interesting connection to our ancestors. History shows us that it's kind of a part of human nature to want to alter your body as a means of communication and belonging to a community. And if that really is the case, I'm sure that piercings will always be a part of the human story.